Hey guys, thank you so much for uh, sending in your questions. Um, we are now going to answer a few of those and uh, feel free to send your questions at the website, tie in that guy. Uh, and the first question is, uh, Bill Hortons says, uh, as a retired Marine, I love the accuracy of the military jargon in both the show and the books, and you guys have a better handle on it than shows in a contemporary setting. I was curious how you were able to do such a good job with that aspect of the storytelling. Um, yeah, honestly, uh, the trick as a writer is to just give a shit. Um, I think a lot of times, um, and I'm not bashing other writers here, but I'm thinking a lot of times, you know, when people are writing stories, they'll, they'll focus on one area as the important bit of the story and the other stuff isn't as important. So you just don't spend a lot of time on it or you don't spend a lot of thought on it. And that's fine. Everybody does that. Um, but, um, I come from a, a fairly military family. My, my grandfather fought in world war II. was at the battle of coral sea. I mean, like one of the major naval battles in the history of the world. Uh, my uncle was a Marine in um, Korea, was at the Battle of Chosun Reservoir, which was a huge uh, ground battle uh, for the United States military. And I've I, I spent a lot of time with both of them before they, they both passed and had a lot of conversations with them. And really from a very early age, even though I was never in the military, really came to understand that while you can agree or disagree with the uses of the military uh, as, a, as a political tool, um, the people, the, the men and women who serve in the military are just people doing a very hard job that's often a dangerous job. And you have to respect the commitment that it takes to do that. They, they get paid almost no money. Um, so, I mean, the, the, I, I, I very early on learned a respect for the people who serve. And because of that, it matters to me to at least put some effort into getting their experience of the world as right as I can. And uh, Daniel, fortunately, my writing partner, Daniel, uh, understands my desire to do that and agrees with it. Uh, Narain Shankar, our showrunner on the show, uh, wants that, you know, verisimilitude. He wants us to get it as right as we can. And, and to be fair, we make mistakes. We get things wrong. I never served. So there are things that I'm going to do that aren't quite right that somebody who did serve is going to recognize. But I at least care about trying to get it right. So, you know, we do the best we can. Uh, you were in the you were in the Navy, Wes. I mean, do we do we get more stuff right than we get wrong, or how do you feel about it when you're doing this stuff? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, I think you got what you were saying. Yeah, like I I find that you're incredibly knowledgeable about and you, Ty is the kind of person when he gets interested in something he does that deep dive, uh, and he's he, he's got. Uh, an incredible memory. So he remembers all the stuff that uh, he's read in the past about military, military history, proper military bearing, uh, how ranks work, um, military strategy. Uh, if you kind of see how when they're preparing to go into certain <clears throat> type of battle, military terms. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you know, Ty cares, the, the writers and everybody involved cares a lot about that. And so, um, that's obviously a priority to them, and, and I think they've done a great job with it. Paul Graham asks, Wes has talked about actors having presence for days or about Thomas Jane really being honest in, uh, really being honest in his acting and really throwing himself into a role. What hurdles did Wes have to cross, uh, hurdles did Wes have to cross to be able to be that honest as an actor? What were those learning lessons early on that helped him overcome vanity? Have, I mean, have you so have you overcome vanity? Uh, well, well, here's the here's how this works, right? I think some uh, I'm I'm more than I'm more joking than not, but there is a little bit of truth, and I'm not, you know, it, there are some you know there's some actors that do these uh, that will do roles, and it's like you know it's like they wallow and shit and gain weight and you know they, you know and they they do all these things and you're like oh what a, what a brave performance and it's so free of vanity and sometimes that's true but sometimes it's like well no it's it, their vanity as an actor <laughs> outweighs their vanity as uh you know in their physical beauty you know whatever so um you know there's there's still vanity at play there but uh i'm just kidding when i say that so uh you know i, I there was a um uh, 
I remember when uh, one of the early days uh, when I was studying acting and I was in a class and in the class, uh, the, in the, the lady that we were working with and it was Uta Hagen, it was somebody that worked with Uta Hagen and they were taking her technique and everything to LA. And one of the, and in the class, what you, what the purpose was is to be on stage, you bring all your personal, like, let's say that you're in the stage on your, in your room and you're getting ready to go out the next day, right? You're getting up in the morning and you're getting ready to go out. So you bring all this, you, the set is your room and you bring as much personal stuff as you can to, to, to the set and you're on a stage in front of the whole class. And so you get up, you get ready to go out to the next and do your thing for the next day. And the purpose of this exercise is because we, you know, observe ourselves every morning when we get up, we know our routines, we know we do everything like that. And what you learn is how having a whole theater full of people watching you changes your behavior. And you can't help but try to manage their perception of you. You try to show something, a side of yourself that isn't necessarily authentic or it isn't necessarily true but you want them to like you. You want them to think of you a certain way. You want them to, 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 uh, to you know, all these things that are tied up in it. But when you watch that, the more they try to perform, the more they try to get you pulled into what they're doing, the less interesting they are. Yeah. And it's because they, they're, they're now deviating from authentic, authenticity and honesty. And so... When a person, if, if you put a hidden camera in a room and you watch somebody get up and get ready, the reality is it's interesting. Their behavior is interesting. It's honest. It's authentic. They're, you know, the weird things that we do when you don't think anybody's looking, like the, you know, the little rituals that you have. And the point of the lesson is, is that now you have to take that level of privacy and intimacy and authenticity and honesty and you sew that into the imagined circumstances of whatever the play is, uh, and then you, you, you strap on the point of view of the character and what the character wants within this, and in, unless you achieve that level of honesty that you feel when you're by yourself, if you, do, if you can't bring that private feeling of honesty that when you're having a conversation with your, an, an intimate partner or one of your best friends, and then all of a sudden you're on a camera and there's, you know, a whole crew around and there's, you know, there's going to be millions of people that watch it. You got to bring that same level of authenticity or honesty. And what over time you start to have a meter, you start to have something inside and you might do things that you think is clever that you think, but you know, it's not honest. That is not in line with what the scenes intentions are, what, what you, how the, the writers are using you to tell the story uh, and you're distracting from the story, you're distracted because you're trying to do things to get attention to yourself. That all of a sudden your bullshit meter goes off, and it gets to a point where you can't sleep at night. And you're like, ah, oh, you know, you know that you didn't, you didn't bring that level of honesty and and to there. And so telling the truth, you know, people. One of the biggest misconceptions is is that when people are like, oh, you're an actor, that that means you're a good liar, and they they don't really understand what acting is because acting is ultimately just telling the truth and it's being able to convince yourself in imagined circumstances that that is now you have to convince yourself uh, if whether you want to use your imagination or you want to use your personal memories but convince yourself to the point where those circumstances are real to you in that moment and you're trying to achieve what your character is trying to achieve and if you can you can catch glimpses I mean you're not psychotic you know that you're you know playing make-believe and you're doing a character but if you can achieve glimpses of really uh, feeling these things and there's an honesty and a truth that comes through, that's what audiences connect with. That's what they resonate with because they see a little reflection of themselves in these scenes. They see uh, what, they, what they are going through, you know, whatever similarity situations that they're going through, they can see that within your scene. And that's whenever you see a performance that floors you, that you just, you, you can't stop thinking about it is because somebody revealed a, a vulnerable part of themselves. They took something so private and so personal and exposed it to, for the service of telling a story. Now, you can take another actor 
and put that same actor in that same story and you watch it and you're mildly entertained. And it's because it's, there's a difference. There's a difference of what that one actor is doing and there isn't another actor doing. And I know I'm going on way too long, but there are certain scenes uh, in movies in, in that there's uh, To Live and Die in L.A., there's a scene that was redone in Heat by uh, Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. And you can YouTube those. And I think, I hope I'm saying all this right, but there is a scene in Robert De Niro and Al Pacino are doing the same exact scene that was in Live and Die in L.A., which was another Michael Mann movie. And you see why De Niro is De Niro and why Pacino is Pacino, you know? And, and people watching, uh, you know, people watching, performing and acting on TV, it's one of the things that everybody feels like, oh, I can do that, which, you, which you, in a lot of ways you probably can, but... There is a, if the, if, if it's really well done, the craft and the technique is invisible. And so, yes, you should feel like you should do that because they're, they're just living in the moment. Two hours later. Um, uh, so that was a very long, complicated answer to, I hope that answers your question. It was a very long, complicated answer, but I, I will say as a, as a producer, as somebody who watches a lot of footage, uh, Narain said something early on, which has really resonated with me, which is that the camera is a dis dispassionate observer, so it sees all of the bullshit. the The camera's mm. not the camera's not sucked in. The camera's not going along with what you're doing. The camera sees everything totally dispassionately, and so when you're watching something that was captured on camera, if there's bullshit in it, all of the bullshit is right there. It's totally on display. And there's a feeling that you get, there's a satisfying feeling you can get when you're like, sometimes when it's over with, you know that feeling when you have a conversation with somebody you don't really know that well, and then you leave and you're like, you feel a little bit like, God, I said too much. I, re I, I revealed too much, or I told uh, that story I told was way too personal. I shouldn't have told that story. There's a little bit of like being exposed. That's how you should feel sometimes after a really good scene. It's like, ah, I, I really, you know, I, I let all my vulnerabilities show out. And if you don't have that feeling, if you're in a scene with somebody and, and you realize they're not listening to me, they're not, re you know, it's like this kind of, which is fine because in life we have, you know, we have conversations with people that don't listen all the time. I'm not and listening you to you right now. those moments? <laughs> and that's my cue to move on to the next question. <laughs> no, it's, no, I agree. I agree with everything you just said. I, and I, and as a producer, as somebody who writes and produces television, um, when I'm watching actors, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, if somebody's not giving me that, they're not good. Ty, should, do, do you want to talk about how you, you might go do an acting class? Well, I mean, I, it's, something I've, it's something I've, I, it was something I was going to do before, you know, the plague years hit, and now I don't go anywhere. But yeah, it's something I'm interested in as a writer to take an acting class. I have zero interest in being an actor. Um, I like being the boss of the actors. I don't want somebody like me telling me what to do. Uh, but I would like a better understanding of the craft that actors use and uh, the tool sets that they use. I think it would make me a better writer, for sure. You know, I, th I think you should do uh, one of the Larry Moss workshops. He does, like, two in New York and two in L.A. And I really enjoy it because I like the time. You know, it's very focused. It's time-oriented. But there's a lot of writers and directors in his class that really want to understand the technique and the craft better. And I think Larry Moss is really articulate uh, and, and a really, you know, obviously he's a legendary teacher. Yeah. Um, but I, I learned a lot from him. All right. So that was the that was the 47 hour uh, answer to your question. <laughs> I hope I hope that it's going to cut. <laughs> it's going to cut together. Great. <laughs> uh, so Matt Fouts, uh, by the way, great football name. Sound like a quarterback. Matt Fouts um, was Orson Scott Card's bean and inspiration Matt, for Amos. Matt was, Fouts has got an arm on him. He's got a He's got a cannon <laughs> for an arm. Yeah, he's got a cannon. Matt Fouts can throw for 100 yards. <laughs> Uh, he's got accuracy problems sometimes, but uh, yeah, he's got a cannon. <laughs> uh, was Orson Scott Card's being an inspiration for Amos? He was not. Um, I, I, I mean, I read Ender's Game. I, I still love Ender's Game. Um, I haven't read a lot of the other stuff, the, the the sequel books where Bean is more of a, I guess he's more of a central character in some of the later books. I haven't read those. Um, but no, Bean and Amos are nothing alike in my head.